Hello, loved ones. This is my third try to get this right. They say third time is a charm. We shall see. I'll let you know. Okay, we are in Matthew chapter 8, verse 14 through 17. That's where we're at in our study. So let me just go ahead and read it before we get into anything. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now, i got to give us a little bit of context again. We have just seen Jesus heal a leper. A leper was a social and religious outcast. According to the Old Testament, they had to be isolated until they were clean. They had to be viewed by a priest if uh, their leprosy went away and it had to be gone for seven days. And then they had to do a ceremonial uh, uh, ablution. You can look that up. That's a real word. It just means cleansing. And then they would um, be accepted back into society if they were healed. But if they weren't healed, they were continued, or excuse me, they were still pushed to the fringes of society and their religious culture. Their religious life was non-existent. They weren't allowed into the sanctuary. And Jesus heals this man, bringing him a double healing. He heals him with a touch, bringing dignity and respect back to this man. Uh, not just a physical healing. The next person we see Jesus deal with is a Roman centurion. Now, he doesn't heal the Roman centurion. There's nothing wrong with him. But there is something wrong with the Roman centurion's servant boy. The one that he is to uh, discipline, bring up in discipline, and to train him up and to be a rigid disciplinarian. Well, we see this Roman centurion come to Jesus. Jesus has no trouble with this. He is prepped and ready to get up and to go and to heal this boy. And keep in mind that this is a Gentile, a, a, a unclean Gentile, and he is also a leader of Rome's evil occupying force. The people who are oppressing Jews at this moment, this Roman centurion is a leader in this group. So Jesus has time for the leper. Jesus has time for the Roman centurion. And now we see Jesus heal. Dun, dun, dun. A woman. Now that may not seem out of place to you, but to a first century uh, Jew, this is a wacky story. And I think Matthew is taking these three stories in turn because Jesus cares about second-class citizens. He's showing us what the kingdom of God is going to look like, and it is not what we might have thought. We see here that as this woman, Peter's mother-in-law, is laying sick in her bed, unable to do her uh, the, the work that she would typically do on a given day, Jesus comes in, to her side, grabs her by the hand, and lifts her up, and immediately she's cured. Now, we know in the Old Testament, it says that lepers had to be quarantined. But very similar to the lepers, there were traditions, and again, these aren't scriptural, but there were traditions dating to this time that said that men were not to touch women at all, period. That you weren't to touch a member of the opposite sex. So Jesus, again, bucks tradition. And he brings dignity and respect to this woman as he heals her. He could have healed her from a distance, as we've just seen him do with the centurion's boy. We could have, he could have healed her with a thought. Or he could have healed her with a word. As it says in verse 16, he healed, cast out demons with a word. He certainly could have offered this same thing to her and not buck tradition. But I think he does it on purpose. And I think Matthew intends for us to see these three stories in conjunction. Her response is absolutely beautiful. I want to say this first, though. Why would, in a culture where you aren't allowed to touch a person of the opposite sex, even by the hand, why would Jesus risk it if it wasn't to bring her a special kind of dignity and respect and a certain kind of care and love 
that she wouldn't be able to get anywhere else. Now, I think her response, like I said, is beautiful. She rises up and the very first thing, as immediate as her healing, she begins to immediately serve Jesus. Now, I have to address this. This is a not-so-uncommon interpretation that I have to address. Many in the church have made this a proof text to suggest that a woman's place is to serve in the home. I find that disturbing. It's not that a woman can't find fulfillment serving in the home. That's for sure. There are plenty of of, of at-home mothers and house caretakers that, that work hard and we love them and we appreciate them. But to suggest that a woman's only place is in the home is something that Christians have, have done and have taught and have purported for years. And I have three glaring problems with it. Perhaps there are more, but... The first problem I see is that the emphasis in the sentence structure is that she began to serve him. Her response to Jesus' healing was that she began to serve Jesus, the one who had healed her. I think that's the correct response when Jesus comes into the picture in our lives and makes us whole is for us to he uh, excuse me for us to serve him i think this actually proves not that a woman's place is to serve in the home but that the place of a christian is to serve their master who has healed them that's my first problem the second problem is just with the word serve let me show you what i mean the word that's translated serve here is also found in Acts chapter 6, verse 2. And the twelve, that is the twelve disciples, summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. Okay, the word used for serve in this context has nothing to do with house service. It is the same word used there in Acts chapter 6. And in fact, the reason we have the office of deacons right now is from the word used here, diakonos, um, the, the word translated as serve or to minister, it might say in your, your version. Um, it has nothing to do with serving in the home. Um, kind of disturbing. The word itself was actually used in Acts chapter 6 to talk about the service of men so that the apostles could devote themselves to their calling. It has much more to do with a person's calling than it does with anything else. Lastly is the context. As I've said now probably a few times, we see the leper, we see the Roman centurion, and we see the woman. These three stories in conjunction, I think the context of these, this, this greater, broader passage is to tell us exactly the opposite, that everyone has equal access to Jesus. So I have an issue with that. I think the purpose of this passage and the preceding two passages was to show Jesus love, care, and concern for social outcasts, for religious outcasts, for second-class citizens, and to show that the kingdom of heaven is going to be very different from what the people at this time thought it would be like. Now, it goes on in verse 16 and 17 to finish up to say um, that... At evening, they brought people who were demon-possessed and people who were sick. And Jesus cast out demons with a word, and he healed all of the people who were sick. And the reason they came at evening, just so you know, you can look in Mark's account of this, it was on the Sabbath day. So they waited until sundown when it was legal for them to go 
bring all of their sick and their demon possessed to Jesus. Well, Jesus has no problem casting out the demons and has no problem healing all who were sick. And now Matthew roots this in an Old Testament promise from Isaiah 53, 4. He says, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Now we have, um, I want to go back to Isaiah uh, chapter 53, and I'm going to read this for you. Isaiah 53, 4, uh, yeah, let's say, well, I'll read four and five. This is a passage commonly referred to as a, a messianic passage by even the first century church. The earliest church looked at this passage as proof of the suffering servant, the suffering savior. And it says here, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgression. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Matthew is tipping his hat to an event that he has yet to record, but an event that's already taken place as he's writing this. He's looking to the crucifixion of Jesus as the means to save and to heal us all. Jesus did take on our, our illnesses and he bore our diseases. He bore our sin on the cross that we could be reconnected to him. And what I'm talking about is a spiritual healing. So as Matthew tips his hat to this and he gives credit where credit is due to the suffering servant, he is also saying with this quotation that Jesus is going to die. The thing that will ultimately win our spiritual healing is Jesus headed to the cross. This is what I want us to end focusing on as we are preparing to celebrate Good Friday in a day. Um, this is so important for us to understand what Matthew is doing here with these three passages. This crucifixion of Christ, this suffering servant who would go on to die bearing our iniquities, our griefs, our illnesses, our transgressions, being crushed by God Almighty so that we could have peace with God, so that we would no longer bear the wrath that our guilt deserves. Matthew is saying that we all have equal access, whether we are Gentile, whether we are women, whether we are you name it. Whether we are sick, whether we are not, whatever the situation is, all have equal access to this gospel. I hope these words find you well. As always, I miss you. I love you. And until we can see again, have a very happy Good Friday in reflection. Bye, guys.